Hey everybody, it's Jeff here of the Mentor Team with Real Realty Executives Cooper Spransy. I guess is where I work, right? And I'm with <laughs> Eric Gorvin of Guaranteed Rate. Um, so, Eric, uh, good to talk to you today. You as well. I think we just kind of wanted to touch on a number of challenges that we're seeing both as a mortgage lender on your end and a realtor on my end as mm -hmm. far as how we're adapting and adjusting in the industry to some of the current changes, right? Right. So I think what's, what's one of the biggest things that you've seen as far as change goes over the last few weeks in either your industry or your business? So I think the obvious thing to point out is that uh, social distancing has made a, a very personable job, very unpersonal. Um, you know, we can't, <clears throat> for obvious reasons, we can't meet uh, with people. And that is a, a very new sort of way of doing the business is learning how to get around that. Um, here at Guarantee Rate, the sort of joke amongst everybody is that we were kind of a tech company that just happened to do mortgages. Um, but I'll tell you that uh, the, the guy that owns the company's name is Victor Cartarelli. He built this platform specifically for, for, for this, right? Is to be able to distance um, and, and still be able to do function and do what we do. And when I say distance, I don't mean just with, with uh, customers and myself. I just mean like for us as loan officers too, to be able to work wherever we need to work. Um, so with, uh, for obviously this, this has made sort of has exasperated this all uh, for everybody. And um, now we have to be essentially 100% digital. So on the front end of things, doing applications, that's easy for us, but we've made the change as well to, to handle closings electronically as well. And, and I think, you know, what you touched on there a little bit, uh, the joke of being a technology company that happens to do mortgage loans, right? And so you're able to ad adapt and pivot and adjust. I think yeah. we're seeing the same thing too with the way real estate is operating as well because, you know, everybody, you can see a lot of people, a lot of agents trying to figure out, well, you know, how do I market my home now? And, um, you know, they're not, they're not as comfortable doing things like video or virtual tours or, you know, taking these extra steps. And yet, you know, those are things that we've been doing all along. I mean, we've, mm -hmm. we've been doing the drone videos. We've been doing interior videos. Um, we didn't do the virtual tours frequently in the past because I feel like, prior um I, I think they were just underutilized by the consumer and not really you know played with enough but now i think they're vital um, we've been doing custom floor plans so you know i i think we're going to see the same thing in our industry where there's you know people that have been doing these things and quite frankly and honestly i believe doing their customers and clients the service they deserve by marketing their property at a high level that are going to continue to be mm -hmm. just fine and continue to serve clients while others are going to really struggle to adapt to this whole, mm -hmm. you know, change and uncertain future. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, as far as the tech portion goes or what you're talking about on your end of doing that, I mean, look, this was the inevitability of where the, the industry was going anyway, right? It was going there. It's just sort of, you know, condensed now because of this. Um, and so the, the companies and the, the people in our business that refuse to embrace the technology moving forward, um, they're really going to struggle. And I think what we're going to see as a result of, of some of this stuff is we're going to see sort of an atrophy in the market of agents and lenders and people who refuse to adapt, right? I mean, <clears throat> the evolution of it all, the adaptation, you have to be able to adapt to survive. And, and it's just not only the best thing for your customer is you being on the forefront of all this stuff. Uh, but for you and your personal business, you need to be able to do that stuff as well to survive. I mean, not to get rich, by the way, just to be able to do what you do on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as, as you talk about like being forced into things, I kind of, the real estate side of things really kind of feels almost like a traffic jam to me, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like you know, last week we were supposed to be in Gulf Shores for spring break and that didn't happen. Right. But, you know, I think about like going on a road trip and you're flying down the interstate and everybody's kind of cruising. And then all of a sudden there's construction or an accident or whatever. Everything just bottlenecks and kind of comes together and, and squeezes. And then mm -hmm. 
once everybody gets through, <laughs> what happens? It's like, you know, everybody kind of just takes off and, and sprints. Um, you know, and I, I, see, I see number one, I see that happening with the market, first of all. Uh, mm -hmm. although there's some, some questions about where that's going to end up going. But the other thing too, is I see that happening with agents as well, who, you know, everybody's kind of cruising along doing their thing. And now we all have to adapt. So we're in that construction zone. And when we get out of that, there's going to be the agents that have been able to adapt and adjust and still serve their clients at a super high level. And those that weren't able to change that, I think we're going to see, you know, struggle for a time period. Yeah. Um, what do you think, what do you think one of the things that you guys have done over the last few weeks to adjust? Um, what's one thing that's been really key for you guys in terms of how you changed the way you've operated? Um, <clears throat> so a couple of things. One is we're prioritizing purchases. I mean, we're doing a lot of refinances, but we're prioritizing purchases. Um, I think there's a lot of lenders out that are just trying to get the easy money and refinance people, squeeze that in. That That's not in our business. Refinances sort of help you pay the bills, but they don't build your business, right? Building your business is done by helping people out and getting into their homes. So that's where we're at with that stuff. Um, the other thing is that we have moved to a full e-close right now. For, uh, for refinances for now, and because we're working out some stuff with the state, state of Wisconsin, uh, on being able to do a full e-close for purchase through us directly. Um, but that does not mean that we aren't going to do, <clears throat> we have a hybrid close. You sign about 65% of your documentation before you ever get to the closing table. Uh, and then a lot of the title companies in town are using a, a notary, or an e-notary to finish up the rest. So in effect, it's... Uh, it's a fully close. It's just sort of a segmented way to do it. Um, some of the title companies have not made those adjustments and you still have to show up, but it's obviously signing parties only. So buyers and sellers are separated just one at a time. Uh, that's a good thing. But <clears throat> I think the, the vision, um, the, the, of this, co of this company and the people at the top, like it, if it, look, when I first got here, there were some bumps. Right, there's no doubt about it. Learning to adapt, but after being here for a little while and seeing how they operate and who's involved and how they do it, it's super impressive. Right, it's people that really, really, really know what they do, and the, and the CEO buys up talent, like really good talent from other companies, the best of the best, and it's pretty nuts. Um, I mean, everybody says that stuff, yeah. but <clears throat> but it, it's turning out to be absolutely true. And and when they stopped our rates a couple weeks ago when the whole influx happened. I mean, a lot of us were really were ticked off about it because it stops everybody to do the business. But this is hard for me to, to, to sort of admit to, but they're way smarter than I am, <laughs> like way smarter than I am. Uh, and it's pretty obvious because they've taken a really bad situation and turned it into a really great situation for not only for us, but for our ability to serve clients and customers and our real estate partners and, and making us um, super strong in a really, really tight spot. Um, as you guys have been going through this adjustment in mm -hmm. terms of figuring out like how to and what to and, you know, everything, um, you also need to keep doing business, right? Yep. So there's sure. actually business still happening as you're, as everybody's trying to adjust. So, you know, what have you seen on the lending side of things over the last few weeks uh, in terms of business or, you know, people's questions, you know, what's the consumer asking for, looking for compared to other recent years, maybe around this time? What are you seeing? Yeah, <clears throat> there's still a ton of borrowers, still a ton of borrowers. Um, people are obviously afraid. They're worried about the economics of all of this, where the market's going. Am I going to have a job? Um, what a house is going to do. I did talk to somebody the other day who talked about maybe I'm going to wait to buy a house because he thinks it's going to flip to a buyer's market. For people who don't want to know what a buyer's market is, that's when there's more homes than there are buyers. Um, it's not. 
we're at least two years <clears throat> away from that, right? So if, if it were to sort of clamp down right now and people's and the market were to flip, there's always a lag in there. And Madison in particular, Dane County in particular, has no inventory. And inventory isn't going to suddenly just show up one day, right? So we're always going to have that lag. So if you're buying a house now, you're buying a house now. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, people ask about the rate environment. Uh, for some people, it's high. For some people, it's low. It all depends on what the leadership of that company did when this all went down. So again, when I was talking about how they're smarter than I am, well, I was that sat there griping about how I didn't have interest rates for two weeks, but now I do, and they're actually pretty spectacular. This might be the best rates I've had all year for anything. Um, it, it's, I mean, it's it's pretty crazy. It, it just <clears throat> customers need to know, buyers of homes need to know that the the market, the economics of it all, is pretty stable. Now I can't say you know, depending on uh, what you do for a living, obviously that can change quite a lot. But um, if you have a good solid job, you have some down payment, that your ability to to get a home right now is not affected. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Um, if you work in sort of a variable environment, maybe you're, you're self-employed or, um, I don't know, you work for commission, you know, that may want to rethink potentially where you're at with that. But, um, our ability to do the job has not changed, right? I mean, there are some lenders that have cut out anybody less than 660 on a credit score. I think there's a big one actually that changed that Thursday, I believe that they changed for them Thursday, Friday. So they're not even, if you're below 660, they're not even talking to you, but that hasn't changed for us. And I know a couple other lenders where that hasn't changed either. You know, as you, one of the things you had touched on a little bit was regarding the market and how things are moving and stuff and and um you know buyers thinking that it's going to turn into a buyer's market and you know recently i went back and i kind of looked and you know in 2000 2006 2007 um you know as things started to go uh during the last one we had over 5000 single family homes and condos available on the market for mm -hmm. for home buyers over 5000 in just Dane county and, you know, recently that number has been hovering like between 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. So, you know, we've had up to five times as many houses available during the previous, you know, at the start of the previous crash. And yet sales have really remained fairly stable, you know, throughout that time period. Yeah. So I, so I think you're right on with there's a long ways to go. I think, I think one of my concerns and, you know, I think, I'm just not sure if there's enough information out there yet or if I just don't know it, but um, is I see all these people that are probably waiting, you know, they were planning on going on the market in April, maybe May now. I mean, who knows when, you know, when things will really start to shake a little bit back to normal again, but you know, people that were looking to go on, you know, end of March, April, May. Um, and now <laughs> they're not. And so they're waiting and how many people come June or July that we're planning on doing April and May are all of a sudden, you know, and that's where I think we're going to kind of have that explosion afterwards. hundred percent. We're going to get a bottleneck. But my concern with that is also what you touched on with some of the economic question marks that we still mm -hmm. have regarding um, how the whole, you know, process is going to be affected for people that were planning to buy a house and may not be in that situation right now where they're able to do it. And so I do think we'll see a little bit of a more healthy market, but I'm thinking it's going to look more like, you know, 2013, 2014 type market than true buyer's market, you know, and, and those years yeah. are still seller's markets. So Right. I think, um, well, I agree with you on that. I also think that we're going to see, this year, maybe even next year as a result of all this, although I think this is coming anyway, is that people with low down payment are going to be effectively cut out of the market, if that makes sense. So meaning there's so many people in the market right now that actually have down payment yeah. and with homes selling high, right? It's not, it, and by the, by the way, I'm not saying that people shouldn't go out and try to buy houses or not get pre-approved or any of that stuff but you're going to be at a massive disadvantage against people who have down payment 
And because homes are selling higher, if you're not a qualified borrower, so if you get, if you're the real, obviously a real estate agent, if you get if you're a real estate agent, you get 10 offers, right? And you get five of them with 20% down. Chances are that the other ones that don't have 20% down are probably out. Would that be accurate? Yeah. Yeah. Usually. I mean, <clears throat> given all else is the same and yeah. you know, similar. Yes. Yeah. So, so we're going to sort start to see some of that stuff. Um, and, and this is sort of, again, like this is sort of condensed everything down again, where a lot of these people who may have been sort of holding off and now they're jumping into the market. Those people with down payment, they're still in the market. Right. Those, that hasn't changed. So a lot of the people doing government loans, a lot of the low down payment, 3% down, um, a lot of the, the no down payment purchase mortgage second programs, like it's just going to be really, really hard um, this year. That doesn't mean, again, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from trying to be a part of it. It's just going to be really, really tough. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with that too, people need to hear it as well. I think it also has to do with where they're at in the market, right? I mean, obviously yep. somebody, somebody shopping on the west side of Madison right now is going to be in a much different situation than, you know, somebody shopping for a like $400,000 home in say, you know, Belleville, you know, or, 100%. Which, you know, there's just a different market level for that. Um, yep. But, you know, the, the other thing, uh, just touching on the pre-approval, I think what people need to know you know, or should hear is one of the things that many, many realtors are doing and our industry is strongly encouraging right now is basically saying nobody steps foot in anybody's house unless a Mm -hmm. approval letter has been delivered before the showing. And, you know, it's always been best practice to have that before you take somebody out on showings. But I mean, you know, best practice isn't always the way that things operate. So, um, but now, I mean, you know, literally people will not get their showing confirmed if they don't have a pre-approval in a lot of situations. And I think that's a very smart thing while we're in the midst of this, you know, to make sure that only people that are actually ready to write an offer on that property right away are are spending time going through the house as a safety measure and a service to our sellers. But, um, you know, with that, you know, that just raises the question of the pre-approval and, and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, the importance of having one on hand right away. Do you want to talk a little bit about your pre-approval process, you know, so sure. people are understanding that and also maybe how your pre-approval measures up against, you know, a basic pre-approval that you might get from other places? Yeah. So um, if I'm pre-approving somebody, I am not putting it out on the market unless everything has been completely verified. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not sticking my neck out for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what that means is like when you apply through our, our digital mortgage application, Um, It automatically runs to see if your employer is on what's called the work number. It's a verification of employment service that's run by Equifax. Uh, If it's on the work number, then we take that. So it'll verify your your income right away. Uh, We have another program that's in there that verifies your assets right away. So you just log into it. It's sort of an intermediary program that runs into your, your bank or your credit union. You plug it, everything in, it jumps in, it pulls all the information out so you don't have to provide bank statements. So more often than not, by the time that I get the application, everything has been verified, right? I mean, that's not always the case. If you have super complicated taxes because you're self-employed or you own a bunch of investment properties, that's a different um, discussion. But even then, you can upload your taxes through the program. And there's another program that runs on the back end that calculates your income straight off your taxes and takes that off of, off of my plate. Not always 100% right, so I still have to review everything. but um the more you're prepared when you're doing the application the better you're going to be like have your pay stubs together if in case we need them have your w-2s together in case we need them Um, have your bank statements and if you own a home your mortgage statements so on and so forth right so when when i issue that pre-approval for you it's been completely vetted completely and i'll make sure i put the language in there too i've verified all your stuff um so that as a list agent, so when you get it from me, you know that it's good. And I, here's the thing. I'm so confident in my pre-approval. I'll call the list agent on, on your, uh, where you're making an offer just to verify, let them know that, that everything is squared away. Um, that's really our process. And when I say ours, not just me, right? It's the other people that work for my team as well in Madison. Uh, we don't hand that stuff out willy-nilly. 
And I think if you're going to a place that is, has a lot of MLOs and they do a lot of uh, business, um, oftentimes when you see those pre-approvals, they're not really worth a whole lot. So um, when, when it, what I'm kind of hearing is, I mean, there, there's places where you can hop on real line, punch in a few inform- pieces of information that may or may not be totally accurate and, and get your pre-approval letter. Yeah. Um, and, and you're probably going to have to do a little bit more uh, work to make sure, you know, you're getting you the information, but yep. in the end, yep. they're going to have a pre-approval that means something from you mm-hmm. versus, you know, a pre-approval letter from other places that really doesn't say a whole lot about where they're at yep. or how strong they are ready to go. Um, and what does that mean as far as like putting an offer together uh, having, you know, a pre-approval letter like yours, uh, that's been, you know, completely and thoroughly dissected versus maybe a generic one from somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, what that tells the, obviously the list agent and the sellers of the home is that they don't have to worry about the financing aspect of it tanking a closing. Right. So but all they're really worried about at that point is, is an appraisal uh, coming in or not coming in or sometimes Jeff we don't have to do an appraisal either because we take part in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac they both have something called an appraisal waiver each one of them has their own particular name for it but it's the same thing so if you have good credit and you have 20 percent down there's a very very good possibility you may not have to do an appraisal um, I've had five or six already this year uh, on purchases so taking that part of it out is huge right i mean to not have to do that once upon a time we did have a program where i could pop in an address and it would just tell me if you're going to get one or not but that that's program has been suspended for a while i think we'll get it back though it's certainly nice to have um but i think the more work you do proactively on the pre-approval side of things right the more confidence that the list agent's going to have in accepting your offer um having that sort of open relationship, uh, communicative relationship with the list agent and the lender too is also important. Obviously we don't, we can't share what we can't share, but um, that's huge. I mean, I, there's just some, some high volume places that just don't do any of that stuff. And, you know, I, when I say that, I don't mean like just huge companies. There's some huge companies that don't do any of that stuff, right? There's one in particular that has a an online app that they, uh that they tout all the time you see it on commercials and stuff and it's just it's garbage and um there's a few lo- local ones as well that aren't um that could do some work mm-hmm. shall we say um but yeah i mean it's a mixed bag right no matter where you go you're gonna get a little of that um yeah no that's my train of thought <laughs> No, but I mean, you, you answer the question for sure. Uh, you yeah. know, obviously, uh, having a strong pre-approval letter that's meaningful um, makes you yeah. help you compete a lot better as a buyer and look a lot better to your sellers as you're trying to put together an offer on why they should select you to buy their house. So um, definite benefit there. Is there anything else that uh, you wanted to make sure people were aware of that as far as uh, what you're seeing or what's, what's happening in your world right now uh, as we adjust? I think the other thing to, to talk about or to be aware of is capacity issues. Uh, so there's a lot of lenders that have capacity issues and through no fault of their own. I mean, when business is going, business is going, but Make sure that if you're pre-approved somewhere else, ask them, are they going to be able to get it done on time, Mm -hmm. right? Because I've certainly spoken with some LOs and not only here locally, but different parts of the country as well, where capacity is a huge, huge problem. Um, I think if you have a company um, that is prioritizing purchases over refinance business, you're going to run into a lot less of those capacity issues. I mean, I'm not going to say that it's not going to be a thing. but most of the time it's not going to be a thing, right? So like the contract is what the contract is and we're going to hit the dates and so on and so forth come hell or high water and the refis just sort of have to hold off. Um, but there are definitely, there are definitely lenders out there that don't have that attitude. It's, it's a damn shame in a market like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, 
thanks for talking. It's good to see you. You can see you too. <laughs> Normally I see you a lot more often than I have recently. Yeah. So uh, definitely good to touch base and, and hear what you go, got going on. I'm going to add one more thing thanks. for you. Uh, sure. As I've seen that you guys have a uh, online um, home buying seminar. Is that yeah. A, yeah. You want that to is, talk about that a little bit here? Before sure, sure. Go? Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I actually, I was planning on when we first started talking about bringing that up and then I forgot about it. So I'm glad you said it. Um, this Thursday, the 2nd of April, online from six, I think it's six to seven. First time home buyer seminar. It's online. It's free. It's on my Facebook page. There's a link. It's on my Instagram account. There's a link. Uh, it's actually on LinkedIn too. There's a link to the, it's a, just an Eventbrite um, link to get you the URL to do the uh, the seminar, but completely free talk. It, obviously we'll talk about sort of the steps it takes to get pre-approved and then sort of working in the, in the minutia that we are right now and the environment that we have, like how do we get past a lot of this stuff and, and still be able for you to buy a house and for us to close it on time. Yeah. Um, well, good. So I'll put the link up. Uh, how else can people find you uh, if they're looking to get things moving here? Or if yeah, they have I mean, you, yeah, you can just, I mean, obviously I have Facebook, I have social media accounts. You can contact me that way. Uh, my, um, my website is just rate.com backslash Eirik Rorvig, E-I-R-I-K-R-O-R-V-I-G. I know it's a hard sort of name to spell. Um, you can just Google my name too. It'll pop up straight away. Um, otherwise you can, my, actually my cell phone, anybody can call me on my cell phone anytime, 608-354-7611. I do have an office phone, but I got to tell you, it like works half the time, the <laughs> VOIP one. So I don't usually hand that one out. Um, but if you do call that one, too, if you find it online, you call it, I will get it eventually and I will call you back. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Eric. Right. I certainly appreciate the time today. Yeah, uh, man. Thanks. You have a great week and we'll talk soon. You too. Take care. Thanks.